This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. Today, we interviewed Stephen Arena on the podcast. This is a great conversation. We got into entrepreneurship and how he founded and is the CEO of Masa Chips, tortilla chips that are fried in beef tallow. Stephen is also a big seed oil disrespecter and sunshine respecter, so we talk a lot about the nuances of that. This was a great conversation. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Today, we are joined by Steven, aka Really Tan Man. So, how's it going? Thanks for coming on. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Great to be, uh, happy to be here. Yeah. Ryan, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm trying the outside setup. So, we'll see how it goes. Never done it before. I'm glad we have a guest with great sound. I'm excited about that. It yeah. makes uh, editing a lot easier. Yeah. yeah. And and a guest that definitely respects the the sun and disrespects seed oil. So that's what I think Absolutely. we're going to talk a lot about today, which is Excellent. great. And um, yeah, so we're chatting a little in the intro as always getting carried away. So then we start recording. So I'm curious, you know, journey from tech to Masa is really, you know, setting the yeah. scene how how did that go about you know your health journey was it a personal you know epiphany of of health and self recovery or kind of how did you really get into this yeah, space yeah on paper it doesn't make a ton of sense um it's very funny uh we did one of these like annoying icebreaker things like with our team at, at like you know recurring every every week over our zoom meetings during remote work for covid and one of the icebreakers was like Hey, if you could eat whatever you wanted for the rest of your life, like ignore cost, ignore health implications, ignore feasibility, whatever, if you could just enjoy one meal for the rest of your life, like every, every three times a day, what would it be? And one of these kids on my team unironically said Soylent. Like, he's like, yep, Soylent for me. So that's, that's, yeah, that's like the stereotype of like tech and it's like somewhat real. So yeah, it's it's uh, not exactly a common path to end up here after being. It's in, it is true there. though because I'll say some uh, a guy from my high school who you know he went to MIT went right to SF startup culture he's doing super well like raised a bunch of money for his startups but he did a whole year of only consuming soylent and like oh, posted about it. I don't know. At, at first, like this was like 2018. Is he I was still like, alive? I, I was what like, did I didn't like? even, I didn't even know what that meant. But now looking yeah. back, I'm like, wow, that was so stupid. Like, what I, did he I, look like by the end of it? Was it? Pathetic? I don't, I don't, I don't really remember the before and after. I don't for sure know he doesn't do it anymore. But that's good. That it's, makes sense strangely true so i just wanted to add that in there yeah so so yeah it makes no sense um but yeah no my my health journey like begins uh probably about nine years ago nine years ago yeah when i was 19 so i was always sick as a kid um i think in eighth grade i got like the the flu twice i got the swine flu and then the regular flu like two weeks later um i had digestive problems i couldn't eat gluten um, my mom figured that out pretty early, like when I was five years old or something that if I like ate like wheat, I would stop growing. So I always had this sort of like special kind of diet, um, which was odd. And I, I never really understood it as a kid. And so I would get special food for my mom, but even still it's like, I wasn't the healthiest person. So when I was a college freshman year, uh, despite the fact that the dining hall was like supposedly better than like, you know, other schools and whatnot, I just had a really rough time health wise. Um, you know, combination of staying up late. Sure. I'm sure it didn't help, but like everything they cook is in soybean oil. They would mix like mushrooms in with the beef patties to conserve beef, like for the hamburgers. It was, it was brutal. Um, and so my health really suffered. And then I kind of had just accepted like that's how life is. But then I was doing a, a, an internship in Belgium after freshman year at like some neuroscience laboratory and they don't have dining halls there. So I had to cook for myself. <laughs> And then in cooking for myself for the first time, I was able to like see how what I bought at the grocery store and then cooked translated into like the feelings that I felt afterward. Um, And so I was able to kind of like, you know, brute force put two and two together. Like, oh, if I eat this, I feel good. If I eat that, I feel bad. And, And 
that kind of discovery led me down this whole like diet nutrition thing. I didn't know anything about this at the time, but, um, but yeah, that's the realization. And I mean, most people, you know, we all think that's obvious, but to a 19 year old, like to a normal 19 year old person, honestly, it's not that obvious. And so I was paleo for a time then I got really obsessed with it, managed to treat a lot of the health issues that I'd had up till that point. And then I was like, well, if I can fix that with food, what else can be fixed? Not just the food, but with health in general, like the human body is so much potential. Like we don't even understand because we're too busy being like sick and, you know, our senses are dull. So I started the whole nutrition thing from there. And that was like eight years ago. Now, like here we are. Dang. I mean, that, that sounds like so many of our stories in, in some sense, but I think it's actually a very unique position to be in when you, when you have to are almost forced to learn something at such a young age. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, many of these, many people don't have an inkling about what they put in their mouth as having any sort of real systemic effect until they're, I don't know, my dad's age in his fifties, sixties, or they start developing some really gnarly autoimmune problems uh, or problems like you had at a young age to where they think like, oh, wow, maybe, maybe something does have to happen. And basically a lot of people have to go through the medical system to realize that yeah it's even a problem yeah people don't people don't seek out solutions to problems they don't have and so if you're a healthy person like if you're you know my friends in college who are like drinking like 17 beers on a friday going to bed at 5 a.m and then waking up the next day and like you're okay with that because you're 20 and you're healthy um you're not going to like you, you'll look at someone who's trying to be healthy like me and be like well what what the hell are you doing what, what's wrong with you um that person's only going to figure this out later on in their forties and their fifties, they get prostate cancer, or they get fat, they start going bald, whatever it is for men. And for women, most of the time they, they get into this. It's usually younger if they do it at all, because they're trying to have kids and they have problems like getting pregnant or they do get pregnant and they have significant problems with their babies. So like most of, I would say a significant portion of the people who are into health, just broadly speaking are like moms who had one kid who had problems and that's how they figured out like, wait, something's not right here. And then their maternal instinct kicked in. And then, you know, the rest of their five kids, like you hear this all the time, the rest of their five kids are like, came out 10 pounds, like never had an antibiotic, like they're, they're just killing it. Um, but yeah, so unfor unfortunately over the past so many years, like the general, the baseline state of health of people has decreased and that's why there's more and more people looking to health because they they're sicker. So it's like that's the silver lining. Everyone everyone's health is collapsing, but the silver lining is it's going to cause more people to like actually pay attention. Yeah, and the other thing too is I feel like it's it's really interesting to have conversations with people like yourself whose whose sort of paradigm around what is health has evolved because I think it sort of falls into a ladder or a tier list almost of all right. A lot of people seem to find paleo first. I think they start almost with either you start with like the most extreme diet like carnivore or something, yeah. or you really yeah. ease your way in and then make your way as far as you need to go. And so it's really fascinating because everyone I've spoke to that's been in the space a number of years isn't doing the same thing to when they started, uh, maybe even yeah. different within a year. So I'd love to know how your, how your evolution sort of like evolved through time. Oh boy. And I know like yeah. me and me and Tristan are crazy about like weird quantum health stuff and sun and grounding and all this nutsy stuff that I didn't think I'd be even into two years ago where I thought food was like the end all be all. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your evolution. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, food's definitely not everything. I mean, it's a lot, but it's not everything. Um, certainly true. I think I started out doing paleo. That was the basic thing. No grains, no dairy. Um, ate a lot of nuts, a lot of seeds, sunflower seeds, Brazil nuts, cashews, um, it, back then in order to, in order to like eat nuts or seeds, like you did soak them. That was like a thing people were aware of. Um, so a lot of soaking and sprouting, um, that carried on for a while. It sort of morphed around. I think the next big thing for me was like, I would introduce probiotic foods. So I started, I think I made cabbage in my college apartment, chopped up a bunch of like, sorry, sauerkraut, chopped a bunch of cabbage, fermented it with salt. I bought like kefir grains from some lady on the internet and like started fermenting like where in the town I was in, there was like this really nice uh, dairy store that I lived close to. And so there was a dairy farm like 20 minutes away and they had a little storefront with ice cream uh, called Arethusa farm. It was really good quality stuff. Anyway, so I'd go and get their milk and then I would put the kefir grains that I got basically from some random person on the internet, did a lot of kefir, 
that was like a meal replacement for me at, at one point i started getting into kombucha um made different flavors of kombucha i would like invite hipster girls over for kombucha cocktails as like my little gimmick thing um fermented tomatoes i made pickles did all that stuff and that that sort of morphed into this like sourdough bread thing which i really got into and so sourdough bread's like super hard to make uh everything else is like really easy like cooking is easy like no offense to anyone cooking is easy baking bread is hard like you know fermenting kombucha child's play baking bread like there's a technique to it that like you have to just learn so I was like, I would be like kneading dough and you have to wait six hours and knead again and do all this stuff. So I would like come home at 2 a.m. and like knead dough on my kitchen table so I could like go to bed and then wake up and then bake it like first thing in the morning on Sunday or whatever. Um, so I did the sourdough bread thing. Uh, I think the next real phase, uh, I try to get into, oh, I try to get into like lentils for a bit. That didn't work. That lasted like a day. <laughs> I like, I got all this stuff. I had the soaking and sprouting equipment with the mason jars, little strainer lids that you can put out at 45 degree angle to like sprout the lentils. And I just tried them. They were just like disgusting. Did you ever um, get into the broccoli sprout stuff? I did broccoli sprouts too. I did broccoli sprouts. Absolutely. I did sprout broccoli seeds and I was like, well, what is even the point? There's like no calories here. So then I just, I ended up sprouting just quinoa and I would eat like little sprouted quinoa and I would bring it to the dining hall. So I would like. Because I, I stop. This is a big problem, especially if there's college people listening. Like, you don't want to give up your like social meal times. Like, this is a big problem. So when I lived off campus for a semester, I would like I was basically by myself the whole time and sucked. So what I started doing was I would make my carb at home and bring it to the meal to the dining hall, and I had like an off campus meal plan. And so I would get their grilled chicken, and then I would eat my quinoa, and then I was sprouting it so it had little tails that looked like sperm, because um, the tails would grow in the quinoa. So I did that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure I'm missing some things, but then the next major wave I think was, I did keto. I got on the keto train in like 2019, I want to say. Um, and then I did carnivore that lasted like three weeks. And then I just went straight full on carnivore and that lasted about six months until I went to Italy. Uh, and then, you know, good luck trying to be a carnivore in Italy. And so since then, I think my general approach has been this kind of like, actual food <laughs> which is like that's crazy thought yeah you know? <laughs> crazy right like oh wow the, like just eat food yeah Wild. but but yeah you're totally right people like get into really extreme things and they end up like focusing too much on the on on one little aspect and reduction reductionism and like it drives people nuts i i, wrote a, I had a q a in my sub stack like the other day and some lady was like i did all these diets my health was fine and now it's even worse like, what do I do? And it's like, she was carnivore. She did keto. She did pro metabolic and it made her fat. And then it gave her IBS and all this stuff. And it's like a lot of these extreme diets, like they are designed to treat people with severe health problems. Like the gaps diet. It's for children with autism. Like keto people brag about keto as being like, Oh, it treats epilepsy. Well, yeah. Cause it's like designed to treat people with epilepsy, <laughs> you know? Okay. Like carnivore diet, like Sean Baker will always share someone who's like, I, I was bleeding from my butthole 24 seven. And then I did a carnivore diet and I'm cured. And it's like, yeah, you had ulcerative colitis. This is like one of the worst digestive autoimmune conditions you could have. So you did this corrective thing and it helped. But it's like, if you're, if you don't have like a broken knee, why would you get knee surgery? <laughs> like if I have my healthy knee and I go to the doctor, and I get knee surgery, I'm going to walk away and my knee is going to be worse, you know? So a lot of these diets are designed for, and the best results come from people with severe problems, but like everyone else doesn't get that. And they just think, Hey, it's healthy. So then they go do it and they actually like come out worse than when they started. Um, it's very sad. And this happens all the time. So at this point, like the, the whole thing is like real food, no press sides, no chemicals, traditional preparation. You know, if you're going to do bread, sourdough, if you're going to do corn, nixtamalize it. If you're going to eat seeds, soak it. If you're going to eat like dairy, it's going to be raw meat, pasture raised, you know, real food ideally in accordance with your like ancestry whatever that may be and then that's that's all you really should should get into yeah i think that's like it's so important because people like to blame that well first off people like to play the victim card right so it's it's yeah. never never their fault and i 100 percent agree because i'd never i mean i was coming off concussions right so i actually did keto for like four months super strict and that was beneficial but then after those four months and i like got the benefit from it, I was like, okay, now like I have some resilience. So I'm 
I'm just not going to do strict keto, you know, carb cycle or, right. you know, coke. It's like, why would that out. even be your goal? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, not even that if fun. it works temporarily, like why would you want to go to your grave? Like mm-hmm. eating ribeyes only or whatever it is. Like the goal, like that you're a fragile system. Like you're so healthy. Well, if I feed you like lettuce, you're going to be shitting your brains out for the next yep. three weeks. You know, like how are, how is that healthy? <laughs> Yeah. And, and that's the problem is I, I think people just get in, well, inherently, I think it's a psychological problem because I think mm. the dogma attached to all these diets is just, you know, it's my team versus your team. It's, you know, what's the most optimal when at the end of the day, yeah, like you said, it's, it's just about real food. Um, it's about like seasonality, genetics, you know, what, what is your like body designed to eat? Obviously, you know, people from like Northern European descent probably do, you know, a little worse with higher carbs compared to someone yeah, who's sure. like from the equator, like her- heritage wise wise. But at the end of the day, if you're just consuming anything like in your local environment from a natural perspective, cause I'm sure we're going to get into like the history of the food system and everything. Like people did eat, you know, bread and uh, you know, things like we oh, just yeah. regularly in the 1800s and there's not that much chronic disease. But it's because they, yeah, they did what you were doing <laughs> in college, right. which is extremely impressive. I, 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 like props to you for doing that. I mean, that's that's insane. Um, yeah, at I, two a.m. But yeah, they were all making everything by by hand. So I, th- I think diet wars are not productive, and if anything, they're a giant distraction to fighting the bigger issue, which is just centralized processed foods. Yeah, like you're gonna sit here and argue like keto versus carnivore on the internet and like meanwhile there are people eating doritos that exist in your country and you're not going to say anything about that like what are you doing we got bigger fish to fry people and even vegans like vegans get trashed so much and it's like i understand it but you have to you have to like respect these people because i mean organic plants is still better than what what is veganism yeah Yeah. vegan could be yeah papa john's and like beyond burgers or it could just be you know farmer's market produce which well yeah that's what i'm saying if if that's what if this is a person and they're just eating like organic produce then it's like are they my enemy more so than like a mcdonald's popeyes you know white house eating or white castle whatever it's called hey friend thanks for listening if you really enjoy this podcast It would be really appreciated if you left us a five-star review on Spotify, Apple, or subscribe to our content on YouTube. This helps us get to a larger reach and a larger audience to spread this wonderful free education. So, so how did you get so big on to the seed oil train? Was that kind of like, you know, a moment as well, or did you kind of just, you know, how big of a, a deal do you think? Like, let's dive into this a little bit because you know, we were talking about it actually on our podcast earlier, just PUFAs in general. So I kind of want to dive in to, you know, really what you think about seed oils, polyunsaturated fats in general and, and why that's so bad for us. Yeah, I firmly, I firmly believe that seed oils are like the single worst thing in our food supply. Like, obviously, there are other bad things. Um, but both in terms of what they are and what they do and the quantities in which we consume them like they're the worst thing. You know, if you ate an equivalent amount of red 40 as you did seed oils, maybe the red 40 is worse, but we don't, you know, like 20% of all American calories, not calories from fat, all calories, one fifth are seed oils. Like that's a lot of food. That's a lot of seed oils. So yeah, if if like there was only one thing I could do to snap my fingers and remove from the American food system, it would be seed oils, hands down. Like even more so than pesticides, honestly. Um, not that like, those are, those are a number of a very big secondary category of bad thing, but I think the seed oils are, are the worst influence just, just because of the quantity, which we, we eat them if nothing else. So I think I got into this, I started social media, I started tan man in 2020 2021, 2021 in the late summer. And I think the last seed oil I ever willingly touched was that like March or April. And the irony, of course, is that it was a corn chip because I love tortilla chips. <laughs> They're like such a convenient food, especially if you're like a health weirdo and you like cook everything that you eat. Um, like carbs are always the hardest thing. You got to boil potatoes. You got to bake sourdough bread. Like that's not easy. So like if you can get some cheese and some meat and some like tortilla chips and some guacamole, like you have like that's good. You food. want something to put stuff on, right? Because you're not eating yeah. – bread really i found exactly you're, not really eating, you're probably not eating bread you need a crunchy thing to put like other things on 
tortilla chips are amazing. Um, and so there's just no getting around the fact that all of them have seed oils. So I think the last thing that I like, you know, gave up of seed oils was the tortilla chips. So, so prior to that, it was like basically like no contact other than maybe if I go to a restaurant, I, I wasn't so adamant about it. But as I learned more in early 2021, then I was like, all right, this is enough. And then I was also tanning a lot back then because I'd, I'd realized the whole seed oil tanning thing. So when I made my Instagram account, it was called Really Tan Man, primarily because I was just really tan. <laughs> like I had lived in Florida for two years during COVID. I was like, it was in Fort Lauderdale. So I was, I was very tan. Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, Sicilian. Uh, so I've always, you know, been more olive skin than your average, you know, Northern European, but I was very tan. So that was the name. And then I think it, just because that was the thing and like the seed oil meme was really happening on like TikTok and Twitter. And then also the tanning piece of the seed oil meme is like pretty popular. I I guess it was just natural that I ended up becoming like a, a big seed oil account, but it's, that's not the only thing. It's not like, that's obviously not all I talk about, but, um, but yeah, so I think that to answer your question summary, I figured it out in 2021 and then the sun tanning seed oil thing is like one of the bigger memes that like I think launched my initial follower growth also. Can you explain like a little bit just just with the, the, the tanning and the sun exposure and seed oils and why seed oils like increase burn rate? Sure. So we know that seed oils, PUFAs are problematic because they are easily oxidized. And oxidation occurs, as we know, through heat, light, and air. Basically, like, or oxygen. Any sort of energy that's coming in to the oil will oxidize it. UV light has a higher frequency and more energy than ordinary visible light. So if something's going to be oxidized by this, by normal light, it'll be oxidized even more so by UV light. So that's the light thing out of the way. The other thing is, like, when you eat fat of any variety, PUFAs or otherwise, <clears throat> the fatty acids are distributed among your tissues and become part of your body. They become part of your cell membranes. They get into your body fat. Like if you eat a lot of seed oils, your body fat has a higher PUFA content. And if you eat a lot of saturated fat, your body has a lot of saturated fat in the fat itself. So now take these two things together. If your skin in the cell membranes and in the, you know, your subcutaneous fat has a higher amount of PUFAs because you eat a lot of seed oils. And then you go out to the sun where your skin is exposed to UV light, which is higher intensity radiation. Um, that means when that light hits the seed oils that are in your skin, the reaction, the oxidation reaction will happen more quicker and with more intensity. And because the oxidation reaction like with seed oils produces inflammatory compounds um, like the aldehydes and all the other lipid peroxidation byproducts, those things are inflammatory. Well, guess what? When you have inflammation in your skin, it gets red and it hurts. And what do we call that? Sunburn, you know? No, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I mean, I know people have talked about that a lot as, as a thing. I, I couldn't tell you if I noticed a different getting off, mm -hmm. noticed a huge difference because I just, I don't know if I really tested it to a degree. I just, I just noticed like, I don't, I don't burn as much as I used to eating For the sure. way I do now, but I also do a bunch of other stuff that I think helps with that. Yeah. So a lot of people like, you know, they'll tan more. So they'll build up their sun calluses. So they like might not burn as much also like they'll just spend more time outside. So yeah, I think it's hard to, you know, completely, you know, account for all the variables, but there's just an overwhelming number of people who are like oh, yeah. on Twitter or Instagram who are like, I haven't burned since I cut seed oils out three months ago and it's the summer and I'm, you know, Irish and I have orange hair and blah, blah, blah. Well, like I have no doubt that there's like a major, a major impact with it. I think one thing that there's like this nuance, so definitely with seed oils, but I think there's this, we talked about this on a podcast earlier today about PUFAs and sort of how PUFAs have sort of been demonized. That's sort of like your thoughts on, on that front of the community, just because I think there's a nuance within PUFAs, like natural PUFAs and like seafood and maybe like well-raised pork and stuff like that, or well-raised well uh, chicken are definitely different in my opinion than seed oil PUFAs and how they interact. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, the molecule is a molecule. Like there's nothing anyone can do about that. Um, the question is like, how much of that molecule should you be consuming? And so if we look to like the flesh of ruminant animals, which I think most people will agree with is like the primary form of food that like humans are really evolved to eat, at least as far as meat is concerned. Um, what is it? It's going to be like two, two or 3% saturated fat or PUFAs, two or 3%. 
and there'll be omega six, and there'll be omega three, and blah, blah blah. But like it's there, so it's just a small amount. The problem with seed oils, of course, is that it's super concentrated. Like you'd have to eat twenty years of corn to get like the equivalent of like one tablespoon of corn oil. Um, no one's eating twenty years of corn. It's the same thing with like people who talk about like the oxalates in in kale. Like you have to eat like twenty like three pounds of kale to get enough oxalates to like, give you a kidney stone or something. No one's eating three pounds of kale, but if you juice kale, then you'll you will. So you don't juice it. Like concentrating things is a problem. Um, so the pufas are the pufas. Like the thing is, if you eat seeds, you're not going to get very much. You know, if you eat, eat a handful of popcorn or whatever it is. Um, and similarly uh, with fish, if you're going to going to go eat fish, you're not going to get a ton because you have the protein and the fiber and the water and all the other the collagen, everything else that makes up the fish meat that you'll be eating. But if you were trying to get, you're going to go to get fish oil and take a fish oil pill or multiple fish oil pills, like the amount of fish that are squeezed into uh, a fish oil pill, it's like a lot more fish than you would eat. But the other thing about fish that I find interesting, and um, <clears throat> I talk about this and it's probably one of the more controversial things that I say, is that different fishes have different amounts of poofas in their fat. In the same way that different plants have different amounts of poofas in their fat. So we all know coconut oil is a tropical oil, and we know the palm oil is a tropical oil. They're saturated. Why? Because in the climates where those plants are, it's so warm that saturated fat is liquid. And if you're a living organism, your fat basically must be liquid because nutrients have to move in and out of it. It has to flow around your body. You have to be able to move, right? If a tree has to bend in the wind. And if you're a fish, you have to be able to move your body so you can swim. Now, if you're, if you're a fish and you live in the Arctic and you are full of saturated fat and you're a cold-blooded animal, you're like an ice cube. Like you literally can't move your tail if your fat is saturated fat. So fish in northern climates or in cold water evolved to have higher PUFA content in their fat as opposed to warm-blooded, you know, say land mammals that it's always 98.6 in there. So, you know, tallow is going to be a liquid or at least soft enough. Um, so, so it significantly varies depending on where the fish are. And so then if you want to take the evolutionary argument, well, who has access to a diet of like cold water fish or Northern climate fish, like Vikings, you know, like that's it. And then if you think one step further, put another piece into the puzzle. Well, who eats cod liver oil? Why does everyone love, love cod liver oil? Oh, the Vikings ate it for their immune system because it has high, it's high in vitamin D. And guess what? The Vikings who live in Northern Europe with no sun eating a food that's high in PUFA, but also high in vitamin D because they don't get vitamin D from the sun. So like you put all the pieces together and like you come to the realization that like PUFAs like are, you know, in abundance are bad, but in particular, they're bad for people who are dwelling in warm climates. If I were a Viking and I lived in cold Northern Europe and I didn't have sun and it was cold, I would be eating more cold water fish. I'd be eating more cod liver oil. I'd be eating higher PUFAs. <clears throat> Whereas... And also, because going back to the sunburn thing, I'm not getting burned, you know, there's no sun. Uh, whereas if I'm going to be living in a tropical climate, I'm going to live in Costa Rica, sun all the time, um, then I'll be eating uh, more saturated fat. So so I think the punchline is to think of PUFAs as like literal antifreeze. Like there's, one, there's very few substances that nature has available to itself that are like going to be liquid uh, below freezing. PUFAs are one of them. And so whenever there's an instance where nature needs an antifreeze, it'll throw PUFAs in there. And that's fine. It's nature. It is how it is. But you have to think about if you eat, if you should be eating antifreeze at the time of the year and the climate and whatever else, your ancestry and all these things. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you said that because it's like, well, actually, I was going to ask you that exact thing. You just literally said everything that I was going to say because, you know, Twitter, Instagram, wherever it's like you, you give people these bite sized pieces of information, but yeah. it's actually like way more complex. It's way more nuanced, contextually dependent. And it's so true. And, you know, I've actually realized this like a couple months ago as well. I think, you know, one of the circadian or quantum health podcasts, probably was Jack Fruz, literally said the same thing was like, PUFAs are antifreeze. And, and he talks a lot about, you know, how DHA is an important like semiconductor in the body, because at those northern latitudes, you get less light. So you have less energy coming from light. So you need inherently more energy. And then also that's why there's vitamin D, you know, in the fish. So it doesn't make sense for, you know, people in Florida to be maxing on sockeye salmon in July. No. So no. you need to apply that to your body. And that goes with the diet thing. Here we go back to just carbs too. Like, are carbs available in your local environment in the winter for Ryan and myself? 
it's not like in Wyoming and Utah, like it is freezing cold here in December through March. Well, you, and... you would traditionally have starch. Yeah, I mean, starch. There's a big difference between starch and sugar. So like, yeah, this is another thing too. Like fructose and like yeah. fruits and stuff. Like, yeah, but, no, but either like, way. Yeah. Maybe you have some honey, you know, in a, in a, if you, honey like gets Polish. complicated, right? Cause ew, you store that forever. I, Polish I, people love honey. Like Northern Europeans in general love like uh, Eastern Europeans love honey. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you are in Northern Europe, the only sugar you have available in the winter is honey. And the only starch you have available would be like your grains. If you, yeah. other than that, it's not really a thing. So. But I, I think for the, for the fats, right? Like New Jersey is similar. You have, you know, it gets pretty cold in the winter and in the summer it's, you know, 90 and humid. And what does that mean? That means like you should, if you're going to consume like more omega threes, more polyunsaturated fats, you should do so in the winter. And then you should switch to more saturated fat, heavy diet in the summer. Like it actually contextually would, would make sense. So yeah, uh, yeah for I'm, sure. I'm glad you highlighted that, but yeah, people honey, are after, people are after like the one diet to rule them uh, all. And yeah, it's like, dude, no. okay, even if you find something that works for you, like right now, what makes you think it's going to work for you next week, next yeah. month, next year, next decade? Like not only does your body change like sort of, you know, on the grand cycle of like your overall life, it changes on the cycle of the year with the seasons. And if you're a woman, it it's cyclically changes every single month. So it's like, how are you going to eat the same thing? But I think a lot of there's a there's a strong like OCD tendency among people in this world. It's like, OK, this is my diet. I'm going to eat this every day. I measured out, I got my, I got my, you know, ruler and my magnifying glass. It has this many carbohydrates and it has this many poofas and I got my scale and I know that many calories and I'm going to wake up at this time every day. I'm going to do my cold plunge, my cold shower. And it's like, it's going to be great. Got my red light therapy, you know, but it's like, bro, like the world is a cyclical place. Like your body's going to change. Your hormones are going to change. There's no way that that thing that you do right now is going to be consistently like optimal for the rest of your life. And even if it is, which it isn't, but even if it is, that's like, and then you go and tell other people about it and they go to try and do it. Like what worked for you is not going to be what's going to work for them. Like for a million reasons, ethnicity, your health history, your microbiome, you know, where you live, all these things. So it's, um, I mean, it is what it is. People like simplicity and regularity, uh, but you really can't expect that if you're going to try to get to the, the, the full, you know, the, the exploding head level of the meme, you know? you know, on the three level meme, if you're going to try to get there, you, you have to be comfortable with and expect and take advantage of like the cyclical nature of reality. Well, and that, and the other thing too, is like, that goes for, for blood work. That's why I think blood work is like a valuable thing. But at the same time, it's like, I always look at it now with the, such a big grain of salt, depending yeah. on, depending on things, because I mean, your blood sugar, um, changes with the season too depending on cortisol, cortisol fluctuations throughout the year. Winter is going to be higher. Same with cholesterol. Cholesterol alters with the season. Uh, getting less sun, your cholesterol is probably going to be a little higher. And all these all these various things, like everything is so nuanced. And that's why, I mean, I have people, I mean, people, so my whole background is I, had a, I have um, autoimmune uh, small fiber neuropathy, basically, that was like really bad a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And I get messages every single day from people that were just diagnosed with small fiber neuropathy. And they ask me, Hey, what did you do to get any better? Like, what exactly did you do? And I was like, well, one, how much time do you have? And two, (laughs) two, like I guarantee you we had it for two different reasons. And the way we're going to have to get better is probably completely different in a lot of ways. Cause I bet you don't live in Salt Lake city, Utah. You might live in India or you might live in the UK or wherever. And so there's mm. all these nuances. So I think it really discourages people to, but at the same time, you mentioned simplicity. And I think like, like while people want that simple answer, they want like the one step, the 12 step solution or whatever, this 12 step program to health. Yeah. The, at the end of the day, I think health is pretty simple if you yeah. understand the nuances of it. Like if you understand your they, they don't necessarily want simplicity. They want regularity. Yeah, like, and it's just not how the zone the world diet. Works. Remember that? Like people were measuring, like weighing their food. Like that's not simple. That's complicated as hell. That's so annoying. But people loved it because it was like a regularity thing. They had their little notebook and they could. Write I I think variant. one of the greatest quotes I ever heard, and I, it might have been Jack Cruz, and somebody it was somebody like Jack Cruz, but they were basically saying like there there is everyone talks about balance, but there is no balance. There's there's no balance, and so. Everyone's looking for like everyone because the the answer for the the norm out there is like eat a balanced diet, 
Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? It it's yeah. really like balance within the season of where you're at and all these other things. Yeah, a balanced American modern diet contains like Doritos like twice a week. Not I keep shitting on Doritos and like Coke Zero and whatever. <laughs> like that's not like if you just take the average of a whole set of things, and if that set of things happens to include really, really stupid things, then you're gonna get part really, really stupid in your average. So yeah. But at the same time, um, I mean, yeah, the, the full on extremism with the diets is, I mean, we talked about this before, like that, that definitely causes like people work themselves into corners by making themselves like not resilient. Um, another thing I, I want to mention, you talked about like testing, like blood work or whatever. I find it funny that people really think they know what those numbers mean. Like hilarious. Like even if, you know, we all like the numbers on the paper correspond to what's actually inside your body. And even if that were like something that was consistent and not just like it was 6am that day. So that's what it showed up and looked like because, you know, hormones and levels of things like move over time. Like in what world does that have any bearing on like the number that everyone else has in their body? Like the, the acceptable range, like who are those people? Are they your age? Are they your ethnicity? Are they as healthy as you? Are they sicker than you? If we're taking an average value of like, Oh, what good cholesterol looks like. And you have a lot of obese people as part of that average or better yet. Like if we're trying to say, if the, if the doctor's like, Oh, it's only among healthy people. That's what the reference range is. Well, who's healthy is like, I, I can name maybe what like five mean? healthy people. I like, I maybe know five healthy people, like of all the people I know, you know, like very few people are actually healthy. Are they the reference range? I don't think so. And even if they were, do they like, are you like them? Are you as old as they are? Are you the same ethnicity as they are, or the same gender as they are? All these things. And then it's like, and then we think we can see that number and then like that means something. Um, it's also, I mean, we, we know this happened with cholesterol, right? Oh, cholesterol's high. That's bad. So minimize cholesterol. Do whatever it takes. Minimize cholesterol. Take statins, do whatever. Even if it's going to like kill you. Minimize cholesterol. But, I, but And everyone rightly knows that that's a big problem. But nowadays people get the same level of obsessed around blood sugar. They wear the CGM. They're like, oh, my blood sugar's high. I got to lower it. I got to lower it. I see people posting about how it's better to drink like a Coke Zero than like orange juice because like, oh, my blood sugar didn't go up as high when I had a Coke Zero. Like as if that were the only thing that mattered for health. Like how do you even know that high blood sugar is bad? Like, is it? I'm not convinced. Like it sounds to me like blood sugar should go up at certain times and be low at other times, you know? But like if you're trying to sit here and say, keep it in the dirt, like what else are you doing? Like how are you not making the same sort of intellectual mistake that the low cholesterol people were making 40 years ago you're making the same mistake but because it's all alternative health it's like okay but yeah so like you focus on this one number and it's like yes it's easy to measure it's easy to modify but it's like that means nothing it's probably it's counter it's useless at best and like actively harmful at worst yeah i think there's maybe like just a very few like blood markers that are actually helpful, like maybe like vitamin D or HSCRP or something. I mean, people, but even, even people that, it's like you that, have to understand the nuance of it. To, but also like, do, and like, do you, right? Like, have you heard of yeah. Trevor Marshall or whatever? The guy in, on vitamin, like uh, on YouTube who talks about vitamin D as like an inflammatory marker. And so like high vitamin D is like bad. Like it can, that's, and wh- where there's a whole body from? of theory. Are so you it's supplementing like, or is it from yeah. the sun, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you can measure things. Uh, It's not to say that like you shouldn't measure things because it's like, oh, it's harmless after all. It's just data. But when you make decisions as if the data were like more important or more real than it actually is. how you feel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, That's that's a big one. And and Ryan, you showed me this too, because I think you told me that we were talking about this a lot, like six to 12 months ago. I don't remember when, but I was definitely way more into blood work and like that it mattered. And then Ryan's like, I was like, my like my testosterone labs like don't make sense. And he was like, "Have you ever like seen something like that?" And he's like, "Yeah, I got one vitamin tested at two different labs on the same day, and they were completely different." Yeah, it was and a B six. I got a B six tested the same day, an hour apart, and it was like completely different numbers. Same wow. same scale. Two labs. Two labs. Same scale. Like they were measuring the same yeah. form, and it was different. Yeah. So like, there's so much, and it's same with uh, we were talking about HSC or HSCRP the other day, and you were saying yours was a little high, and I asked you if you worked out like the day before. And yeah, working probably. out can <laughs> working out can like raise your HSCRP the day before. Yeah. So it's like there's just so many things in there. Unless it's like some crazy number, I'm not really going to look at it as a thing. 
and yeah. even pay attention it's too like, much. It's like it's false precision, and like by measuring it, we like lied. We we were able to lie to ourselves and pretend as if we know things, and we know more than we do, <clears throat> which like we don't. And, so and that, it's that's like a show. Thing. It's like a proof. Like it's like, hey, I'm healthy. Like look at me, or like you know, I'm gonna dunk on other people because my testosterone's higher. When you know, you could even debate like how high does your testosterone really even need to be, and what are the downstream metabolites that are actually being you know, how is that even being utilized? So I'm curious, or like. You know, or like, yeah, so why does the number matter? Once again, like if your tea was really that high, would you be spending your time on the internet talking about how high, t- high your tea was? No, yeah. Or would you be like going out and conquering something? Well, I, I don't, oh, yeah. that's that's great right there because I, I, I get so pissed off about the masculinity space on social media. It's like Greek statues. It's stoic quotes. It's testosterone threads everywhere. Do you know what the real the real men they're not on Twitter. They're not on Twitter. They're no. doing they're doing real work. They're going yeah, they're doing real shit and I love it because all these guys, most of them are anonymous and they just post these incredible quotes. It gets me fired up, but guess what? Like what are you actually doing? And even if you're just going you're just going to a blue lit gym all day and like benching a lot of yeah. weight, like that's that doesn't mean anything. Oh, yet. also, yeah, also that like that's the other thing too is I think I think people okay, weightlifting healthy, all these things we talk about this fitness, it's great. But like, we make such a big deal about it, but it's like, it's literally not even like, it's just, it's, it's just the prerequisites. We're not even at like the one, like the 200 level courses. We're not even like actually doing something like having like good skin and being in a good body composition and and being decently fit and having good digestion. Like all of these things are like, like the minimum prerequisites to have an actual life. Like once you have that, you have to go out and like do something. And if all you end up doing for the rest of your life is finding that thing and trying to like optimize that and like that's all you care about, then like what's the whole what, – what's even the point? The point of having a healthy body and brain is so that it can be effectively used towards some end. And if it's not being used toward that end, why have it? Like it's, what, are you, what are you training for? I mean like what are you seriously. Training for? Yeah, are you running a marathon, bro? <laughs> you're answering a power and, – and still even if you're running a marathon, so what? Like marathon, this is a good example. What is a mar- like? Why do we? Ha- why is it a marathon? It's called the marathon because the Battle of Marathon in the Persian War, when some Greek dude had to run from the battlefield where they just like defeated the Persians all the way back to Athens in like one day. It was like twenty-seven miles or whatever a marathon is, and told them that they had won so the Athenians could like relax or whatever and, and like not expect like a naval battle or whatever happened. I don't know the details, but like he had to run twenty-seven miles because he had to like deliver a message on foot because the enemy was like vanquished or whatever. You know, you're just running a marathon just so you can run 27 miles and like take a picture on social media. Like, you know, what's the point? And so it's not that I don't think working out or fitness is good. It's just like <clears throat> the idea is that it's a lesson to teach you self-discipline, you know, strive overcoming discomfort, you know, inst- like delayed gratification, goal setting, all these yeah. things so that you can actually like, go do something useful with your life. It's programmed adversity because I feel like people, and I respect that because I don't think we get enough of that anymore in society. Like everything's so coddled. So people use it for that. But then at the end of the day, yeah, it's like you, you got to have some functional goals. I mean, for me, yeah. it's like I want to get stronger and more fit so I can like go hike and like carry an elk out of the woods like three miles. Cause yeah, like literally the feed yourself. Thing. Yeah, you feed yourself. It, there's Great. an end goal, but it's like <laughs> uh, – people just become bulky and it's like everyone needs to get huge and jacked because the bodybuilders like just set this image and it's like, yeah, I mean, there's a reason like we don't bear mitochondria in our muscles like gorillas do because it's probably not optimal for health to be that big. Yeah. It's not that useful. Like also if people, cause it's, and it's also the money Twitter people who are also like, okay, we got to go to the gym. And it's like, okay, yes. Once again, the lessons of self-discipline and what you said, program diversity, like overcoming obstacles, all these things. But it's like, it's like, uh, I don't know, you're, you're in the military and you learn on a flight simulator and then you never end up getting into an actual plane and flying. It's like you have to take the simulation or the, 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 the workbooks or like the training wheels and actually then go use it. Like, otherwise, like, what's the point? Like, what, what did you accomplish? Like, and so I, I think that's true generally of like health, but in particular, it's like the, the fitness specific culture too. Like, there's a lot of people who work out who like do cool things and that's not what I'm getting at. Like, and it supports the health of doing those cool things. But that's the point. I think there's more people who do all this stuff and then don't do anything useful. And they, they're unable to like transmute that message into something that like helps them like level up. Um, and that's a big waste of everyone's time. Yeah. I mean, speaking of sort of the gym bro stuff is like, I, w- I will go to the gym and I'll be there for maybe like 30, 45 minutes. But I would, I mean, I used to go for three hours 
And I would see people that even on those trips, which were already like way too long anyways, and I wasn't getting any bigger as is, but I would see people there that were there before me and still there after me. Like, what are you doing with your life? That I'm like, how do you have much, have that much time? How does anyone have that much time to, to sit? It's I mean, crazy. You, you, I mean, there there are people who make a career out of this, and like more power to them because they're actually like able to like turn that into some economically viable thing. But it's like, so when I was in school, there was a joke that like people would gra- like go to college and then graduate, and then for like a year or two, all all they would be able to find as a job, especially if they majored in certain things, was like to be an SAT tutor or like a college essay coach. And all they could do is then just like teach people how to get into the school. And it's like, okay, so they can get into the school and then do what? Graduate and then do the same thing and teach other people how to get into the school. It's like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, like it's just like a recurring like Ponzi scheme thing, you know? Um, so there's like a similar thing, uh, you know, with the courses in the course world. Like I'm going to teach people how to like get jacked. So then what? They can be jacked and then have a course where they can teach people how to get jacked. And then what so they can get jacked enough to have pictures that they can put in their book to teach other people you know that's all that it is <laughs> like 90 percent of it what a feedback loop <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy the best is for me is when i see people in salt lake city in the summer on the on the stair climber inside when there's mountains in in the parking lot you can see the mountains that are 15 minutes away and i'm like guys like the disconnect is so real. It's, it's in, insane. But, you know, speaking about all this, you know, accomplishing things, mindset, I think, yeah, you exemplify that. Obviously you took a leap of faith from your, your engineering tech job to starting Masa. How was that like? I mean, that's real adversity right there is when you put yourself kind of going all in on something you're passionate about in a business and still is <laughs> still is going. So I'm, I'm curious, maybe you shed some light on, on that process. Like how did you finally, you know, what moment did you realize it was time to like fully leave the corporate world and, and go yeah. all in on this? And yeah. How, how was that a mental battle? Sure. Um, so I, I think the, the general, the reason why this is a thing in the first place is because, like you can tell people how to be healthy all day and go on about micronutrients and food and eat this and don't eat that and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, it's not as if people are unhealthy because they don't know these things. People are unhealthy because those things are just not part of the everyday cultural life that they live. In the 1950s, people did not have better willpower. That's why they weren't obese. They just like went to the food store and bought the food and the food happened to not poison them. And nowadays you go to the food store and buy the food and the food happens to poison you. That's it. Like the reason why they're sick is because the food is bad. So you can tell people and, and like influencing and knowledge is like great, but it's only so useful because unless you can give people actual things that they can go do that can fit into their life that are convenient and make them healthier, like the physical availability of products, whether it's red light panels or food or red light glasses or water filters, whatever it is without that, there's no progress. And so I realized that after starting my account and like, you know, getting a lot of DMs from people like, how do you manage to blah, blah, blah. Where can I find this? And, all the food in the grocery store, I had to throw out half my pantry. Like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, we need to give them a pantry that they can actually eat. So that was like the the grand motivation for this is like, there's no reason why chips are bad. There's no reason why candy's bad. There's no reason why cereal, well, maybe cereals, eh. but there, there's no inherent reason why any of these things that are in the center of the grocery store at least can't be neutral at best or neutral at worst. And maybe they're good for you at best. Um, you know, organic ingredients, like traditionally prepared, whether it's bread, it's sourdough, it's a corn, it's mixed and lies like we talked about. Um, if there's a fat, it's going to be an animal fat, like a pasture raised, whatever. So that was like the motivation for this. And I was still working at, um, at my job at the time doing like 10 hours a week, classic tech bro, uh, remote, uh, in New Jersey. And when we started Masa, uh, I was still working. Um, I would like go on the weekends to our little commissary kitchen and like fry chips with like the four guys that I hired. And then we would like during the week, someone would come over. This is in my parents' garage. They would like come over and print out the shipping labels and UPS would come like three times a week and take the boxes out. Um, And after a certain point, we realized like, okay, this is like a real business. Like I wasn't, we weren't making that much money um, and still not relative to what I made and like tech life. Uh, But I was like, if I'm going to do this, like just even the psychological pull of like having another thing that I don't like, it's like draining. You know, people say it's like 
it's draining. Even though it was like less than 10 hours of week and 10 hours of work and actual like per actual week. Um, it was like such a, an annoying thing in my head that I was like prevented from being like creatively and dedicating myself to this thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of advice. that's like, Oh, start a side hustle and then wait until your income from your side hustle outpaces the income from your actual job and then quit your actual, like it's too mechanical. Like it doesn't work. Like it's the same people who try to like tell you to make decisions based off of data or market research. It's like, you know, the Huberman lab types meme where it's like, the Huberman, you know, the, I forget what the, what the meme is like, but it's like, that's not how that works. Like for you to create something like creation is like a divine sort of act, right? Whether it's like life, literally like you have, you get pregnant and you have kids. That's like the one type of creation humans can do. The other type of creation humans can do is they can like make things. No one else can like, that's all, that's all there is to creation. And no one else, like no other animals can really like do that. They can't take an idea and like put it out into the world. Um, and so that requires like your brain and your focus and like your soul and everything else to like be applied to that thing. And so continuing to work in my job was just like, it it was hampering that. And so I was like, you know what? Screw it. I, um, I mean, it helped fortunately that I, I bought a rental property when I was in the beginning of COVID just cause like I had nothing else to do with my money. And then I sold it (laughs) like two weeks after we started Masa and so I had a bit of cash that I could just like quit and like live off of. Um, but yeah, I was like, that's it. We got it. We got to make this work. And then the other benefit, of course, is like once you do that, like it has to succeed. Otherwise, like you're screwed. So, I mean, I, I, I would not say that we've succeeded yet. We're, we're doing well. We're growing. I'm working on it. Um, but it's definitely I don't regret the decision in any way at all. It was very very well timed i think yeah i mean nothing uh lights a fire under your butt than fire <laughs> like the, right. the the pressure i mean i talk about this with tristan probably every other, every other day i'm probably like him i probably message him and i'm like man i gotta quit my other job like in the next like year or something i'm gonna kill myself like he's just like it, it's just it's even the like you said it's even the minimal amount of workload you put into mm. something else that it, it, if it's something you much. hate it doesn't matter. Yeah. It takes up that much bandwidth. Way too much. That yeah. it's I mean, that being said, you don't want to be reckless. Like there needs of to course. be that thing that's like that you can do instead. So it's like, I mean, I'm not saying you are. I just like want the listener to not just like go and quit their job and then be homeless. Like no yeah. plan. Yeah. You got to have it. Like, you got to have a strategy. Well, that was my, no that plan. was my next yeah. question sort of was like, you obviously probably had some sort of business plan with, yes. with Masa. So could sort of explain that process of like getting that in place because that's, I mean, that's something that I've been working on with my own stuff just so yeah. that there is an out because I think, yeah, the dumbest thing you can do is, is have no plan and expect yes. it to work out, even though that's sort of like, I think the story that maybe gets propagated when you hear things like that is like, oh, it works out when you work hard and put your, no, put no, no, your no, 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 no. I, I've seen a lot of people like, it's not just you, you work hard. It's like smart people work hard and then it works. Yeah. Like. Like there's a lot, of, and I don't want to name any names or you know get any too specifics, but there's a lot of dumb decisions that happen in like entrepreneurship, and people fail, and then it's like people feel bad, and then it's like sucks. Like that that's the thing. If you're gonna be an entrepreneur, and not everyone has to be an entrepreneur, nor should they be, but if you're going to be, don't fail, because <laughs> if you do, not only does like that create a lot of misery for you and your family and everyone else, um, it like gives more room for like big corporates to, like scoop up market share from whatever else you were doing or whatever you were doing. Like, let's say you start a bakery and it does well or whatever, but then you you screw it up and it fails. Guess what moves into where the bakery was like a KFC or something like, so you give ground to the enemy basically if you fail. And then also you serve as like a a discouraging example for other people. Um, Like if you run a small business that does good things, like I, my, I would argue it is like morally imperative that you succeed. And success is not just about working hard. You have to like not, you have to be smart and sophisticated about it. And that's one of the things that like I was fortunate to have through college where I went to school and what I majored in, who my friends were and whatever else is like a significant like primer in like business and modern startup entrepreneurship landscape and all of the things. And it's not something that you like, you don't need to go to a fancy school to learn. You can learn it. There's plenty of resources on the internet or whatever. But like a lot of the, a lot of the people I talk to in like everyday life, just it's things that no one knows anything about, like raising venture capital money or like how to leverage debt in the right way. Like normal people, if they're good people think that that's bad. I don't have credit card debt. We don't do debt in this family, but sophisticated business people 
like know that debt is good if you use it in the right way. Because if you can invest money and get a rate of return higher than the interest that you pay on it, that's it's a free roll. You do that. Um, obviously, there's risk involved, but it's like there's this sort of like business sophistication that you have to know and have in place. Same thing with marketing. A lot of people, especially in health, and I think it's getting better nowadays, honestly. Um, but people don't get marketing. Like how many alternative health websites have you been on getting obscure supplements or like some red light panel or whatever it is? And it's like the ugliest shit. And it's like, but the people have the mentality where it's like, oh, I have a good product. So people are going to buy it. You know, all the other guys, you know, the big companies with their good marketing, they have shitty products. So, you know, I have good products. People are going to buy it. No, they sell their, like, how do you think they sell crap? You sell crap because of marketing. So imagine if you took good marketing and applied it to a good thing, then what would you sell? You know, um, marketing is like the branding is part of the product. So like, that's something that people have to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I mean, financial stuff, uh, it's dealing with suppliers, knowing how to build things, knowing how things work. Social media too. I see so many like people in health and whatever that like are starting businesses and they just suck at social media. Like it's terrible. And it's not the easiest thing ever, but it's also not that hard. Like study the accounts that do a good job and just do what they do. Like literally just copy them. And then, you know, eventually you'll find your own style and you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, I know this isn't an, exactly an answer to, to the original question, like how do you form a business plan? Because there's just so many things involved. Um, think about, yeah, think about everything. Like talk to someone who's done what you do. Maybe not the exact same thing as if it's something that's that innovative, you won't find someone. Talk to someone who's done what you plan to do or been in the industry. Figure out what's involved. If I want to start a supplement company, I'll be talking to a bunch of supplement owners and be like, oh, so how do you get the product done? What, what regulations do I need to know about? <laughs> right? You have taxes employees, shipping, how does shipping work? Do you know how shipping works? How, e-commerce, how do you have a website? Like distributors, if you have a physical product, laws, legal shit, incorporations, um, like incorporating stuff. Like, do you know about fundraising? Do you know about investing? Do you know about debt? Do you know about finance? Do you know accounting? Um, none of, and it's very daunting and it's not, none of this is impossible. You can learn all of this and there's plenty of people who are willing to talk to you to teach you how these things work. Um, but you have to know these things. If, if your idea of like getting money for your company, like in getting investment for your company is going on Shark Tank, like, I'm sorry, this is not, no, this is not a good sign. <laughs> um, do better, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know uh, if that's, su- oh, the last thing is be smart about what you sell. Okay. Like there are people who sell things that are just hard to make money on, whether it's like, like a, like a liquid product. Oh, I'm going to make a shake or a smoothie or a juice or whatever. (laughs) Have any idea how heavy water is and how expensive it is to ship? Like Hint Water sells a dollar bottles of water with shipping or whatever. They don't make money. Like, yes, they sell a hundred million dollars worth of Hint Water a year, but they don't make money because you can't make money shipping water for a dollar per bottle. You know, that's just like not how that works. Um, And so like a lot of people don't understand that they hear a hundred million dollars and they're like, oh, wow, what a good company. Um, so yeah, don't start a drink. Don't um, don't start something that's like really like commoditized. Like how many liver pills are there? A lot of them. Maybe you could be the next big liver pill, but like no matter how well you do, you're never going to be better than ancestral supplements at liver pills. It's just not going to happen. Maybe you, you come up with some variation, maybe some other format of taking it. Maybe it's a smoothie, maybe it's a drink, maybe it's whatever. But if you're just going to make the same thing someone else is making, you're not going to win. Um, so yeah, also be smart about what you're, what you're making. Like, uh, I don't know, there's, I could go on and on and on about this, but, um, like, I think one of the, one of the crucial insights here is that when people see it and it works, um, I keep my phone. It's been a crazy day. Um, when people see it and it works, it looks like it just happened and it looks like an accident and entrepreneurs have every incentive to make you think that it's an accident. Like, oh, it just happened. Right place at the right time. I got lucky. You know, everything just happened. Right place at the right time. I got lucky. Like the winds were, you know, in the, in the sails and whatever. Like, no, (laughs) like they knew what they were doing. They schemed, they plotted, they learned, they figured shit out. They probably had a lot of friends and family connections, which like are helpful and you you can do stuff without it. But like the more, the more that you can leverage, the better. It's like, it's a fierce world out there. The more that you can, the more ammunition you can get on your side, the better. Um, and then when it happens retroactively, it looks like, cool, great. But no, it's, it's a lot of thinking and putting the pieces together. Um, 
So yeah, I, I know that was very instructive. No, it's it's really it's really funny. Just before Tristan jumps in here, I just had a thought because you were talking about the liver pills and like making the same things as other people. Like, don't do that. I think I I feel that way about so many things. Um, it's sort of like like when I see people blow up on YouTube or something like that, and I've met a lot of these people at conferences and stuff uh, over time. It's like I've never met one of them that that really was really random. Maybe a couple yeah. that were pretty random had one viral hit and then they kind of rolled with it. But everyone I've met is as calculated as Mr. Beast, but maybe less eloquent with it. Like everybody's, yeah. everybody's calculated. And so it's about being smart. And so one thing that I thought was funny is like I, the thing with the liver pills is sort of how I feel about when I see courses from health, health gurus selling courses. I'm mm. like, how many different ways are there to raise testosterone that I need to pay $399 for in a, in a course that I download? Yeah. It's, so it's, it's pretty funny how, what some ways are out there, but there's always yeah. a way. Smart, smart people have every incentive for you to think they're not as smart as they are. Just putting that out there. Um, so, so, you know, make sure that you're operating on like the, the psychological mental level that like you don't get taken advantage of, or you don't fall under some false delusion or something. Well, well, I think that's the biggest difference too, is like the mentality because a, you have to be willing to put yourself out there, whether it's on social media, whether it's within your personal network. Like, I mean, I, I know out of all my friends from like high school, there's, there's a couple of guys that they do have, you know, experience raising capital, you know, getting debt, uh, that can be leveraged for, you know, startups and things like that. And it's like, these are the guys that you want to talk to and you want to just pick their brain. And then for me, it's like, there's other things like you're kind of saying to be careful about like going all in and failing. And I agree with that, but there's things you can do. Like there's smaller side hustles. I mean, Hey, just having a, a rental property. I'm, I'm the same as you. I have a rental property too. That taught me so much just about passive income, sure. you know, setting up an LLC, how taxes work. Um, and then there's other, you know, I started working with a local ranch and helping them ship products. So I learned a ton yeah. about shipping and shipping meat nightmare, but guess what? Now I know more about shipping. So there's a way for you to get involved and learn these skills or at least a good chunk of them without going all in. So that's what I would implore people to do because like you're saying, you really want to be like, like in it and really confident that you found a niche that's going to work and that your product is, you know, you thought about it from full life cycle perspective, but in order to do that, you kind of need some experience. Yeah, you have to have first. background knowledge. Yeah. I, that's a great point. Like, I mean, this is not the first business I started. I'd started, I don't know, three or four other, four or five other businesses, three of which were like at least moderately successful in the sense that like I didn't lose money by the end of it. Um, yeah. Like, and I learned things from all of them. You know, it's not like a first rodeo and, and you, you know, you learn things even from not doing, having direct experience. But like, also the other thing is like, you don't, to your point, Tristan, you don't have to like go all in and have like a world changing business to like get by. Like not every, like there's only so many people on earth. Not everyone is going to like own a giant business and like succeed or whatever. And even if, even if they could, it's not necessarily something that everyone would want to do. I mean, like it, when it works, it looks very glamorous and people are like, Oh, I want to be an entrepreneur billionaire. It's like, do you have any idea what these people had to do? <laughs> like any idea, like what they had to do over how many years to like get there and like the chance of failure and all these other things. Like, I mean, it's a lot of stress. It's like not fun a lot of the time. You know, you, you want to be healthy and go to the gym for three hours, especially I really find the money Twitter people hilarious. Cause like they want to go to the gym for three hours, tan for two hours, like go to a yoga class or whatever the hell. And then they're going to like start the next big company. Like, what are you talking about? Like delusional. But that being said, if what you want to do is go to the gym for three hours and go tan, by all means, go ahead. There's plenty of things you can do that will support that lifestyle that like will conform to it. That don't have to be like sort of like crazy mess. Yeah, I think it's the I think it's the trade off, right? And like, you need to kind of understand what you're getting into before you take the full dive. And yeah, yeah, for me, it's something I, I go back and forth with too. And you know, I'm in that kind of same position with tech job and working remote, and got a lot of you know things that are evolving. But you know, I'm being patient and and seeing how it works out, right? So it's like you know, people give yourself options, right? Like put yourself in different places and connect with people like Twitter has opened up so many connections for me, like getting on social media and just kind of being authentic and, you know, putting yourself out there. 
you'd be surprised how many people will, you know, reach out to you and, and yeah. there could be business opportunities there. Like you're saying, you don't need to be the guy who's going to be the one to just drive everything off the ground by yourself. There's other people who are already doing that. Yeah, that for them. need like a right hand man. And then I, mean, I did a chief of staff. I don't know if anyone's, yeah. if anyone's interested in that, but like, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, a, I'm hired. I'll hire for that. Like, you know, um, that's a very good point, especially about social media. I think, among the biggest assets that we had doing this was really tan man, like the internet presence. Um, and honestly, if you're thinking about doing anything like this, or even if you just want to network your way into a cool job, like make a social media account and like get followers like that alone will teach you like a ton about particularly about like marketing and networking and like presentation and branding and perceptions and copywriting and all these things. Uh, photo editing, all all of these things that like whatever business you do, like will for sure help you. Like there's no business, whether it's a B2B or a B2C. Also, if you don't know what those acronyms are, figure that out. Um, there's no business that you could start where like being famous won't help you. At the very least, it won't hurt you. Um, I mean, investors, we've gotten like half of our angel investors came from people that DM me on Twitter. Like, if I didn't have that, like we would have no money, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so like that's a super useful asset. And then if you build it successfully, especially like try to build a following in the niche that you're going to be doing in, like that you want to be an entrepreneur in, whether it's like water quality or tanning or poofas or beef or Bitcoin or crypto, whatever it is. Um, and if you're successful in that, then, um, then that I think will give you confidence. It'll give you learnings. Um, and it'll also give you a platform that will actually like help you be even more successful because now you have your initial customers. Um, so yeah, that's a good point, honestly, for sure. In, in 2023, you want to start a business, go become famous on the internet. Even if it's like 10,000 followers, like do something. You can actually do a lot with a micro, like a micro level community. Like there's actually a lot yeah. of, you can get a lot of pull, whether that's like, I, I use coaching as an example, just because I think that's like a big thing in the, in the health space is like a lot of people start there and then kind of move into other stuff. Um, but like you can get like if you can, I mean, the whole goal is like you need to connect with people. And so you got to find like I think what you said was really, really important about finding sort of your niche in there and then sort of leaning into it a little bit. Uh, I also at this at, at the very same time, I almost hate the the niche culture because I, I feel like there's so much more than just just like the one niche that you're in Whether like if you're in like the seed oil camp and like that's your big thing or the insulin resistance camp. Um, and that's like your whole page is like insulin resistant. I see it on like Instagram specifically, like all mm -hmm. the time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much more than just like this equals this. But at the same time, it's like everybody's got to play the game. So you got to find like where you fit in that game and then just kind of milk it to your, uh, to your advantage. Cause that's just how it goes. You, you can't, you can't be all the idealistic, whatever you really are all the time. Cause I just don't think that's oh, yeah, how yeah, success yeah. is made. You really, you have to, you have to be able to like speak the language of your audience for sure. Um, yeah. That's very important. I think and the other, the other part of that too, is that like, if you're thinking, Hey, I want to go be an influencer in this space or whatever, like fitness. Oh, but there's already so many fitness influencers. I'm just one more, like, like tan man said to be differentiated. How can I be like another fitness influencer? The thing is your product is not just the product. Your product is like the product, the physical thing whether it's a, or an ebook, whatever, plus the way it's presented, the brand. So like Moss chips are not tallow fried tortilla chips. They're tallow fried tortilla chips in a package with orange stripes called Masa, you know, like that's part of it. So if you're thinking about like branding a page, like how many yoga accounts are there? <clears throat> there's so many yoga accounts, but there's yoga for girls who did ballet in high school. There's yoga for girls who live in Miami. There's yoga for dudes who have long hair. There's like a million ways to present the same thing that's yoga to different audiences. And like, just like if you're like the same thing with supplements, the reason why we even have so many liver pills is because there's liver pills for people like dudes who think they're a caveman. There's liver pills for dudes who think that they're a biohacker. There's like liver pills for all these different like identities. And each of those products is like distinct enough. Granted, the more similar it is, the less differentiated it is, the less big it's going to be. However, you can still get pretty far just by like, taking something that exists somewhere and then bringing it somewhere else. Um, I learned this the other day, uh, like Caraway, the ceramic pans. Um, there were a lot of ceramic pans before. They were like the first one that like really blew up and did super well. Um, but the reason why, one of the reasons why they did really well 
is because they didn't go to cooking influencers to like sell their pans to like chefs. They went to like moms who deck who are doing interior decorating and like interior designer and like aesthetic girls on Instagram and because their pans look good and they're pretty and they like, you know, they fit together and it's like an OCD thing and they look nice on your kitchen counter or your, you know, your, your counter. Yeah. Your counter in your kitchen. Um, they, they brought pans into a market that never thought about buying like a nice set of cookware as like a lifestyle activity. And now they do. And Caraway is super successful, even though like other people sold ceramic pans too. So it's not just about being differentiated in your physical product. Like the product includes the brand too. And it's like who your target is. And that's what you have to be differentiated in. And so that's the comforting thing is there's like, in, like there's only so many products you can make, but there's infinite product slash brand combinations you could do, you know? Um, and so if you're going to like, once again, go start a fitness account, well, who are you going to speak to? Maybe it's fitness for real estate agents. If you're a real estate agent, maybe it's fitness for tech bros. Cause you're a tech bro. Maybe it's fitness for construction workers because you're a construction worker. I don't know. Um, but like you can brand your product in many different ways. And that's, um, that's something that people can like figure out and learn about. Yeah. I think that target audience is, is huge. And it's, I, I always found it to be a kind of a struggle because it's like a lot of people, they want to be really broad and, and, you know, well-rounded and, and reach this large audience. I mean, I struggle with it too in, in like my actual corporate job because I do like marketing for, for, you know, electronics and it's like, oh yeah, you could reach this whole audience and, you know, get 1% share, or you could have a really targeted, um, you know, community that you're going after or customer or industry. And it's like, yeah, maybe if you had 20, 25% share there and that's like a way higher chance of success. So yeah. I think Pick people a niche need to get rich. Okay. Yeah. There you, you go. Us? Pick a niche to get rich. Like even then, the ones that are broad today, they, they had a niche at one point, like Starbucks is everywhere. Right. But mm -hmm. like 20 years ago, Starbucks was for like insufferable hipsters in like Seattle, like cities in the Pacific Northwest. Um, like people did not spend $5 for a cup of coffee 20 years ago. Those was like not a thing that they did. It was for like young, like single urban people who like consider themselves refined, even though they're not, but like that was their target niche. And then now Starbucks is everywhere. Like Apple was for like transgressive artist characters who were like hacking around in Silicon Valley who like hated authoritarianism and were basically like anarchist libertarians. That was what Apple's for. And now look at it, you know, every big company like picked a niche, got rich. And then with the more money, you can expand out into broadening circles of less nichiness, if that makes sense. And eventually you'll tap out right? Like Apple sort of tapped out at like everyone in America because people outside of the country are like kind of too poor to afford iPhones. Um, but that's a pretty damn big market, you know? Um, but still you started with, same thing with the iPod, like they went back to their roots, like started with the transgressive artist people, like who really cared about music. That was their niche. And now everyone was listening to music in headphones. Yeah, that's a great point. You can always branch out later. So it's like, you need to be yeah. successful with that, like little community first. And I kind of want to tie this back to Masa as, uh, you know, we, we get close to wrapping up here. It's like, you know, obviously you guys are the only ones doing like beef, chow beef towel fried chips, tortilla chips on, that I'm aware of at least and that are, you know, pretty readily I'm available. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it seems like a tough market if you just stack it up against like, you know, any of the, the Lay's or, or yeah. basic Frito chips because they're so cheaply made. And that cost difference is quite large. So obviously someone like myself, Ryan, we're like, we see that perceived value because we know of the health, you know, differences. How do you get the average consumer to kind of change the mindset or at least try it? Like, is it a flavor yeah. angle? Like, how are you kind of wrapping your marketing around, like getting more of those people on our side for Masa? Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's, um, it's tough. It's tough. I bet. It's, it is the big challenge. Of course. Um, the people who are buying Masa are not the people who were buying Doritos two weeks ago. Then they discovered Masa and switched over to Doritos. The people who are buying masa are people who maybe have used to eat Doritos and then stopped because they're not healthy and they care about their bodies and they would rather go without than eat something poisonous. That's, that's who the target market is, you know, like eventually, you know, masa become cheaper, I'm sure. And then more and more people, right? Like that's our niche. Eventually it'll grow bigger. We'll be move beyond the niche. And then we'll be like, the ch like people will, will leave Doritos for masa more and more people. But for now, 
that's not really the target. If that is, maybe there's three people, but like, that's not, that's not what we're focusing on. We're focusing on exactly right. People who understand what their body is worth and are willing to spend money in behalf, on behalf of making it better. Um, that's a lot of people. Like that's not, that's not a trivial amount of people. How many people have an Equinox membership? It's like 250 bucks a month for a gym or more 300, yeah. 350 and like there, and- there's a lot. And, and before Ryan chimes in, I kind of want to just say this too, from the consumer side of things, like, you know, this is like who we need to be supporting because obviously you're small you're starting up. Like you're never going to compete with like these big players, even if you had the same exact ingredients, like you oh, yeah, yeah. No, this manufacturing. Absolutely footprint. Right. So it's like be willing to pay a little bit more to support these types of brands as they grow, because that's only going to benefit you as a consumer going forward. Cause you know, if, if everyone just tried to start, you know, a, a better quality brand and the price difference, just nobody bought it, then nobody would try another one. Right. So we need to, I think as a consumer, like, those trends are dictated by the purchasing dollar. And we talk about that a lot here, yeah. but don't be afraid, whether it's for meat at your farmer's market, whether it's for masa chips for like your holiday parties or whatever, or just because you haven't had good chips in three years. Cause you become so neurotic about health, like yeah. be willing to take that dive. And yeah, maybe, you know, calorie per dollar, nutrient per dollar is, is not there, but sure. I mean, and if you have no money to help like, moving it forward, if you have yeah, no money, and if you have them, if you have no money, like, yeah, buy ground beef and carry gold butter and like, you know, try to get a job that like makes more money. Like I'm yeah. not going to try to tell people to like buy moss chips. Like I'm no, in no way is it like a necessary component of a healthy diet. But if you're going to eat chips of any kind or you're in a situation or you want that luxury or, you know, it's convenient because like I have it for lunch every day because like so I don't have to make a carb or whatever. Um, super helpful, you know. But, you know, not a necessity. If money is really the thing here, buy like ground beef, buy like 30 pounds of of it at once and like some Kerrygold butter and like white rice, you know. Um, but but yeah, I think the the thing that you mentioned about the like if if we use the same ingredients as, as Frito-Lay, perfectly, totally accurate. One little trick that I think might uh, be of interest to people here is like, you know how when you go to the grocery store, when a product's on the shelf at the grocery store, you pay 10 bucks for it. The store, the store itself takes like, say, $5, $4.50 of that $10 goes directly to Whole Foods, for example. Then what's left over goes to the distributor and then to the actual producer of the product. So Frito-Lay has deals with all the grocery stores that carry it, where instead of if, they, if, if people paid $10 in Frito-Lay products, instead of the grocery store taking $4.50, the grocery store only takes 2 bucks, And the rest, that two fifty goes back to Frito-Lay. Which means because they're making more in every dollar of goods sold, they can make the same amount of profit at a lower price than any competitor. So even if I like get a militia and go take over a Frito Lay factory, you know, and it's mine, I'm the captain now, and then I like try to sell these chips that are not called Frito Lay, but it's the same stuff to some store, because I'm not Frito Lay, they're going to cost more, even though it's the same thing. Um, so yeah, it's tricks like that that like allow everything to be so cheap. Um, and you know, people obviously care about money. Everyone cares about money. Sure. But like, if you're a type of person who looks around the world and is like, why is all the food poisonous? Why is everything trying to kill me? Why does the water have crap in it? Why is there microplastics? Why are my clothes made of polyester? Why is my food of pesticides? Why is this? Why is this? that? And then you're not going to spend money on things that don't have that. Then you can shut the hell up because you're part of the problem. Like Frito, it's not as if Frito Lay and Lululemon got together one day and were like, "Hey, we're gonna, you know, swamp the world with like seed oils and plastics." Like, oh, we're gonna force this upon them and we're gonna give them hormone disruption. Like, no, they sell things that people buy, right? We're not talking about government here. Government's separate. We're talking about companies. Companies have money not because like they were given a donation, but because you bought stuff from them. And so if you don't like the fact that they have all this money and they use it for illicit purposes or things that you consider illicit or things that you consider destructive to the environment or health or whatever, the only reason they have the money to spend on those things is because you gave it to them. So stop giving it to them, you know, and tell everyone, you know, to also convince everyone, you know, to also stop giving money to them. If you can do that, the problem happens overnight. Boom. Right. Like if literally everyone woke up tomorrow and did not buy a free delay product, free delay would go bankrupt. Done deal. And then we would never have this company trying to poison us with seed oils. 
The problem is, of course, that that's not likely to happen. Um, but you can make that outcome happen quicker and, you know, bolster the likelihood of that happening by doing what I just said. Stop paying them money and tell everyone you know to stop also paying the money. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it from a consumer side goes back to, and I probably said this 10,000 times on the show, but it's just like priorities. Like, I don't think people know what their priorities really are. I think they have a vague idea of what they think is important or they think they think some things are important that really aren't. Um, and they sort of center their day around that. And from a consumer side, it's like people just don't realize how much power they have mm-hmm. in their dollar and what they spend. So much power. I don't think, and people don't really, I don't, I don't really know too many people that, I mean, just I, with the amount of people that are in massive debt, just like normal average Joe middle class or lower class whatever economic people are just the amount of debt out there is just like insane. And that's mm-hmm. partially due to mindless spending mm-hmm. on things like people have subscription accounts to streaming services, like five different streaming so services they don't watch. for one show. Yeah. They watch one show and then they'll hear it and news. then they never watch it again. But the, the thing that gets me is like those people, whatever, but like then, then there are people like our kind of people. I need to get into this too specifically, but who will like go on about, Oh, I don't like Disney cause they did this. And it's like, well, dude, why do you have a Disney plus subscription? Or like, why does your, son or daughter who uses your credit card have a Disney plus subscription, you know, like that's another thing too, that parents really don't, I don't know how many parents listen to the show, but that's like always a big one. Like there's always like boomers complaining about, Oh, the kids, blah, blah, blah. It's like, dude, you literally give your kids your Amex and they buy this thing. Like who, who is at fault here? Who, where is the culpability lie? Yeah. The, the last, I think, and I have to get going. I think you want to wrap up too, but the last like little thought experiment thing that you can think of is like money is not just like, it doesn't just change hands then it disappears. Like if you give money to Frito-Lay, not that you give money to Frito-Lay, you give money to everyone that they give money to and everyone that those people give money to and on and on and on and on and on. It like trickles through the money supply. This is like, you know, micro econ or macro econ, like one one Um, So if like, if you think about, and I'm saying these people are bad, it's up to you, the listener to decide for yourself. But if like, if you like, okay, you don't like the company Frito-Lay. Well, do you like their executives because you pay them? Do you like their employees because you pay them? Do you like the people that those people vote for? Because you literally donate to those candidates because you gave money to those people and those people make political donations. Do you like the brands that those people also support? Because you just paid for that, you know? Um, And people really don't think about it in this way. And if they did, they would kind of become terrified, which they should do to like, you know, shock themselves into like reevaluating how they live their life. But like, Every dollar you spend trickles throughout the world to all the people that are getting paid off of the people getting paid off, the people getting paid off of recursively from the dollar that you spend. So you're funding all this stuff. If you don't like it, it's very simple. Stop paying for it. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of all I want to say on that. Yeah, I think I think that's the irony and hypocrisy of so many of these like ideological people. Yeah. It's like if you took it, what what are they actually spending their money on? Whether it's you know the extreme left or the extreme right. And then you look, it's like, yeah, yeah, well, you're, you can't even have the claims that you do when you're, you'll, you're, you are fueling this. And yeah. that's what we always talk about is like food. You can have the biggest impact because it's actually one of the few things that you can buy locally yeah. or from like a small company, small producer. Like, you know, you can't buy a laptop or a car or sure. anything like that from like startup really. And uh, that's what it comes down to. So I think that's like the decentralized aspect of it. And of course you value that heavily. And that's what it's all about. But I never thought about that. It's like, yeah, you, see, you can go look up who, uh, you know, the lobbying statistics, which I wrote about in my book, A Good Amount. It's like, yeah, who's Frito-Lay donating to? And is, is that aligned with your values? Yeah. Like, how many people actually look at that? Probably none. None. And uh, then it just all gets wrapped round and round. So I, I think that's a great point. But all right, man. Yeah, thanks. This is a great conversation. I think it's really helpful because entrepreneurship is like a very daunting area that there's like, yeah, the money Twitter the all these people, they like glorify it and then also like don't really shed a whole bunch of light on kind of like what's the important, you know, skills to have and, and mindset you need to be successful. For and sure. I think you did a great job highlighting that. Today. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the la- one of the, and I think, okay, I, oh, I yeah. keep, because they don't really like give the details <laughs> or whatever. They don't do useful things. This is the problem. Like all they do, the drop shipping and whatever else. Yeah. Like just selling more crap. You're just 
you're contributing the problem. You're not doing anything original. You're like trying to find a product on Alibaba that anyone can find. And then you're going to resell it and run some Facebook ads and like drive up the cost of CPMs for all of us who actually try to sell real things. Like, so you can sell your a hundred thousand dollars of product at like 20% margins with like the cost of advertising is like 30%. So you like lost money, you know, it's like, but it attracts, it's like the same time with like crypto day trading people, like 5% of you might make some money and the rest of you are going to lose money. Um, but people like to get rich quick. So it's like, if, yeah, that's what I should add on. If you want to get rich quick, just go work for a job that pays well and like try to free roll as much as you can. Um, if you want to actually do something that helps people, then go be an entrepreneur. That's what I, that's what I'll say. And you need to have that low time preference, which is, you know, what we align with heavily, right? Yeah. It's like good things take a long time to build. So yeah. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Where can people find you and Masa? Sure. Uh, MasaChips.com, M-A-S-A-C-H-I-P-S.com. Um, we'll get you your code so you can give them a discount code, um, whatever you want it to be, uh, so you can add that to the show notes. And then uh, Really Tan Man uh, on, on all your favorite social media platforms. Awesome, Stephen. Well, thanks so much for coming on. That was a great conversation. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Decentralized Radio. Awesome. We'll see you next time. Thanks.